So as I was saying, let's start the introduction on tensors and index notation. So first of all, we we kind of talk, uh, talked about that last time. Uh, we are, haven't explained yet what a manifold is exactly, but at least the general idea, we will get into more details uh, in the next lectures. And we may do a very formal, very algebraic lecture just cause Panda wants to suffer. And I did it for my thesis, so it can be fun for some special lecture in between. But for now, we only want the general idea of what a manifold is, uh, not a mathematical idea, just whatever space that you can think of that is curved, like the surface of a sphere or like a 3D sphere. Or just, I don't know, a sheet of paper that has been folded. Stuff like that is what we think of when we speak about manifolds. So curves, uh, every curve space with some concept of continu continuity. So there are infinite points in here. Uh, you can also consider the sheet of paper to be flat. That's what we talked the last, the last day, uh, special relativity using a flat manifold. So manifolds is all these kind of spaces and we are gonna work on these spaces. Uh, the first thing we have to consider is, okay, in physics, normally we talk about vectors. So I don't know, a particle is moving at a certain speed. The speed is a, is a vector. And we said that all the points uh, are written as a four coordinate. Mm, yeah, four coordinates, like time and three coordinates of space. So we need to generalize this concept of a vector in the general R2, for example, uh, space, and take it to a curved space. So the main problem with this is that here you imagine like, okay, uh, let's define a vector that goes from zero, zero to one, one. Then the vector is a narrow that goes from here to here. But in curved space, you cannot consider that because <clears throat> vectors cannot be like bended. You cannot take a vector from here to here and say it's this line because, I mean, it makes no sense. It's not well defined. You can have a million of vectors that go, a million of lines that go from one to another. You cannot think of it as an arrow here. So what we are going to consider is, again, we are going to define this uh, more formally later, but right now it's just an idea. We are going to consider what it's called the tangent space. So this tangent space, you can imagine it like guess you have a manifold that is curved like the ones before and you have to consider a point. This not this letter P here as a, as a subindex is not arbitrary. Uh, there is a tangent space for each P, P being a point from the manifold. So a point from wherever you and whatever manifold you take. So consider one point in the manifold and the tangent space will be, in this case, will be a flat sheet of paper that you put in the in the curved space. So that is tangent tangent to this point. So if you look from here, you have something that's curved, that's a manifold, and you have a sheet of paper here that is tangent on the point P. And all the vectors we are gonna consider um, living here. So we are gonna consider the vectors in this space, all that have origin in P. We cannot think of them as arrows again, because uh, this tangent space is not uh, the normal plane or stuff like that, it's more complicated, but to visualize it, it's easier to, to think of it as all the vectors that are on the tangent plane to a certain point on, on the manifold. 
and all these vectors that we are considering. No, you don't. Okay, Pablo said that uh, he is assuming that tensor is equal to matrix. We haven't talked about tensors yet, and we will talk about them. A tensor is can be represented as a matrix. Uh, I don't know if always I should look at it, but normally yes. But it's not a matrix in itself. We will get into it. So uh, yeah, you have we have our tangent space. And here is where all our vectors are going to live. So we'll consider all the tangent spaces for all the points in the manifold. Okay. Yeah, Panda said that. No, not always. I guess you can have infinite argument tensor or something like that, or not linear or something. Well, if we take all of our vectors in this space, we are going to call these vectors four vectors because they, they have four dimensions, like the same way our coordinates were written in four dimensions. It, it will happen the same thing with the four vectors. So, so now that we know we have our objects and we know they live in the tangent space, we can, and this is a vectorial space. Everyone knows what a vector space is, vectorial space. If someone doesn't, please say it in the chat, and I will do a quick explanation. Everyone knows? OK, fine. So this is a vector space. Therefore, we can take a basis. We will call, it, we call the basis like this where mu is a, is an index that in our special case, okay, we are going to assume we are staying in Minkowski space. So we have a four-dimensional plane, flat space. Therefore, our basis, the tangent space to a plane is another plane of the same dimension. So our tangent space will have dimension four. What this means is that these spaces have to have four elements. And we will take the indexes from zero to three. So with this basis set, we can write every vector. Uh, we are going to call it A. A. Any vector A from the tangent space could be written as a mu and the factors here. We, if you remember from the last talk, um, this notation with an index here and an index here means that it's called, well, you can uh, do the Einstein summation. And basically this means, so you take the first value of mu and just sum it over. And it will be, uh, this is not an arrow, this is a hat. So you will take all the components. And it's the same thing as normal bases and normal stuff with vector space, but with a simple notation, so we don't have to write everything down. You can imagine here that there is a summation over mu from 0 to 3. And it will be yeah, the same thing. So this is important because we are going to go over this. Uh, like We will use this all the time to simplify and not have to write the summations all the time. So bear it in mind. OK, so we can write our vector as a linear combination of the elements of the basis. And we are going to call each of these elements the components of the vector. Trying to write. So these components, you have to be aware that by the fact that uh, they have the index here, and not normally in math you would put, you would put the index in here, but in physics we don't use this notation. 
we put it for normal vectors on top always. And if you notice, the basis of the vector space has the index underneath, but we have this parenthesis to mark that this is a vector. So this has its own components and stuff, but this is only a number, like it's a component. It's not uh, it's not an entity as a vector. The vector is, is this one. So that, that's the only thing that this parenthesis makes. Okay, with that, let's give an example. Let's let's take a curve, a parameterized curve. And as we say the other day, this uh, is a way to write mathematically any curves on your space, where this parameter changes, and as the parameter changes, you travel along uh, along this path. So this function describes this path. So if you have this kind of path specified by some coordinates, so yeah, this index means exactly that. And this, for each value of this index, you have one coordinate. The general path will be written just like this. Uh, you can define the, the der derivative. So you can take the derivative of the mu component over uh, lambda. So it will be more different here. If I give too much examples and like too much detail, uh, and I'm going to slow just, um, but there are different levels in the, in the questions. So for each one of these components, you can derive it, there are a function but simpler than this one, and you can derive it over uh, the parameter. So we consider each one of these, and we know that uh, the, the set of all derivatives forms a vector space, because you can sum it, like you can uh, sum over it, and it gets, it's still in the vector space, there is an inverse, and all of this. So this forms a vector space, so we can consider this to be a vector that we will call v mu and this vector is one of the kind that we had before right it's in the tangent space the ve these are the components the vector associated with these, com these components will depend on lambda and will be would be this one So as we said, this would be the components that we showed here, and these are the elements of the basis. Normally, we will omit the, the basis. We will write simply, instead of writing V equal uh, components and the basis, we will say simply we have a vector V mu. And we will understand that there is a basis associated to it, and that these are the components in that basis. Um, that's it. So one important thing that we are going to show for every object we, we are going to study today is how it transforms. So last time uh, we saw that we had Lorentz transformations. That preserved our uh, invariant interval. So we want to see how these objects behave over Lorentz transformations. So we can see that these vectors, when you apply a transformation on them, they behave as follows. So if you remember, uh, yeah, this is a bit of a, this is, this object, if you remember correctly, is the matrix associated to any Lorentz transformation, which were boosts or rotations. And 
well, in this, it behaves in this way when you transform it. So if you look at the indexes, you see that like this one can come and this one, um, well, we will get into this uh, later, but basically if there is two indexes, one above and one uh, lower, they kind of disappear and you have the same indexes here. Here, you, you see that it's consistent. So this one goes with this one, this one goes remains the same and goes here. We, have, we will have to be consistent with all the indexes uh, along the, the course and the, this lecture in particular. So this is how our vector transforms. And in a lot of places, uh, you will see definitions like a vector is mm, an object that transforms like a vector. Uh, this means that it is an object that transforms in this manner. So with these indexes uh, contracting in this way. One thing to notice about this is that even though uh, in this transformation, the indexes are changing, the components are, are changing, the vector itself doesn't change. So the, the vector itself, I'm still drawing it like an arrow, but it's just so you uh, can see it. The components may change if you change the base. So if you have a base that's this one, and you transform the base, like a learn transformation would transform the bases. But let's think of a simpler one. If you just have the same, but you transform and you put a basis that is half the, the length of the previous of the previous vectors, these components will be two times say A and B, two times A and two times B. But this doesn't mean that the vector itself changes. It's just the components that changes because the basis is being transformed. The vector itself is an entity that doesn't change. So we, have, we just said that the basis is transforming, but how is it transforming? So we can see that it transforms with this equation. Okay. Yeah, see that this time our indexes are in the lower side. So this matrix is the inverse to this one. In fact, if we notice this, so in normal matrix notation, if you have the matrix and the inverse, you get the identity. In the index notation, if we have uh, this matrix, the inverse is going to be this matrix, matrix. So we will have that lambda mu nu. Well, I can remove the. Yes. is the same as mu rho equals, we will, we, here we have the same ones. So again, we will only have left these two, and this is equal to delta rho mu. And what is this offset? So this is the identity for, uh, do you see the, the mouse or only what I draw? Okay, so this object is defined as follow. You have one if mu is equal to rho, and zero if mu is different to rho. So that's the identity in your case. And we see that um, this matrix times the inverse is the identity. Okay, bye. Bye, Jing. Don't worry. Okay, so we have seen. 
that the vector transform and the, mat the basis transform by the inverse of that matrix. So, um, okay, let's go now to the next object. We are going to study. So we have talked about four vectors. Now it's time to study dual vectors. As I guess, most of you haven't seen uh, what the dual space is. I'm going to explain what it is in a moment. First, let me do a little introduction on what we are talking about. So for every vector space, in this case, the tangent space, we can talk about the dual space. And we are going to consider the dual space that is written with this star of the of the tangent uh, space. And we are going to consider the objects that live in here. That will be functions of the form. Well, this is called the form two, but uh, forms that go from the vectorial space, in this case, the tangent space, to the real numbers. So what is the dual space? OK, so you have to kind of think of a of an abstract, in this case, it's an abstract uh, vectorial space. So you will have to do this kind of transformation in your head. What we are going to do to illustrate a little um, particular case. So let's consider R3 as a um, real vector space. So what we mean by uh, our vector space is that it would take two. Yes, let's say it would take two elements from R3. Um, the operation we take over, the action we take over this. When we multiply by a scalar that is not a vector, this number has to be from real numbers. If we put here a C, we would have lambda as a, as a complex number instead. But for now, real number, it's fine. So we have this three plane. Uh, 3D space, Euclidean, as everything is normal. And we consider the canonical base. So we take vector E1, E2, E3, and we say uh, E1 is equal to 1, 0, 0, E2 is equal to 0, 1, 0, and E3 is equal to 0, 0, 1. So this forms the basis of our space. We can consider, um, well, yeah, that, that means for, for every vector that we have in this space, we can write V as, this is more mathematical notation, but I think you'll understand. So we can write it as a combination of the, of the bases with all these elements that are real numbers. These components are all, all real. So, what we can do with this is define some functions that will take, that will go from our vector space to the real numbers, and we'll take any vector and take this vector to uh, one of its components. So we have F1 of V would be V1, and F2 would be V2, and F3 would be V3. So we are basically saying, OK, if you apply this function to uh, V, you get the first, the second, or the third uh, components. So this forms a basis of what we know as the dual space. So for a V, we will call the dual space V star. So what is this dual space? It's the set of all the functions, all the forms, one forms. I'm going to start to say some words, but to make you more comfortable with the, with the names and everything, but it's a function that goes, simply goes from the vector space to the real numbers or the field you have here, like complex or whatever other field you have. It's simply the collection of all these functions. And these forms a vector space. It is 
easily uh, provable. And it's pretty straightforward that this is the basis. Again, I'm not going to prove it, but it's, a, it's an, easy, um, an easy exercise. And I wanted to explain uh, another way of seeing the dual space, because this is the abstract thing, like way of seeing it. But it seems very weird at first, but uh, in reality, it's very natural. It comes in a very natural way. We are all familiar, I think, with the fact that, with the, not the fact, uh, with equation systems, like if we have, for example, a system of equations like this one. These we are used to solve, solving this kind of problems in high school and stuff. And it's a very standard thing to, to know. And it seems pretty easy at first. So this is normal, you're used to it. We can think of this as components of a vector. So this would be a vector. But if you see closely, my disk disappeared. Okay. If you look closely, what we are doing here is applying a function on this vector so that you take f x equal uh, one times its components, etc. So basically, um, how do I call it? Let's call it. Let's call it omega one. If we take this vector, this will be part of the dual space because these are the components in the basis we told before. We are basically taking, um, what, sorry, omega one, if we apply it to X, we get, the first parameter times the first element of the basis, so f1, applied to x. This is x1 plus b1 times f2 of x. This is x2. And again, c1, f3 of x. This is x3. So we have been thinking about dual spaces from a, for a very long time without noticing they were here. Okay, so now that we know more or less what a vector space, uh, dual vector space is, let's come back to the tangent vector space, the dual tangent, sorry. So we take the dual of the tangent space, we'll call this the cotangent, space. It's time you see co something in math. Uh, it's the dual of the thing you were of the rest of the sentence. So we take this object, as we said, it's the set of all the one forms. So omega uh, is in this set if it's a one form, so if it's a function that goes from the um, tangent space to R and is a linear map. So by linear map, we mean that if you have, say, lambda is a real number, whatever number you want, and mu two, um, u, then this is the same as this function. This is the condition um, of linearity. Okay, so given this space, we can consider the vectors in this in this space, which will be these functions. And we can consider again vector space, then we can consider a basis. The basis we are gonna take now, we are gonna call it theta hat and here we're going to put mu. So you have our basis. We can write any of the elements of the, the cotangent space 
as the component times the elements of my a new. Well, this is a new, even if it doesn't look like it. Uh, times the elements of the basis. So same as before, we go we sum over the indexes, and we get the components and the elements of the basis. And with these components, remembering the definition that we with these elements of the basis, uh, given the uh, the definition we gave in the example. We simply have that if we, this is a function, so if we apply the elements of the basis of the tangent space, we'll get the identity. This might seem a little bit weird now, but if you look at it um, into more details on your own, I think you'll be fine. And if you have any questions, just, just ask them. So given this, uh we can do the same as before so consider how it changes so we will see that it varies like this under Lorentz transformations so it's the opposite of the um, vectors and it transforms uh the same way as the uh, as the basis we saw earlier and again, the basis will transform the opposite way. Okay, so now we have seen two objects. We will we can notice that for vectors we had the indexes in the upper part, and for the dual vectors we have the indexes on the lower part. So this is kind of good. so how. Let's uh, see how um, the components, how, how these elements act on the vectors. So if you take the omega, oh, let's consider just the vector. So not its components, but the form itself. And apply it to the vector V. So remember, this was a map that goes from V to R, so we can evaluate this in V. I, are you following guys or let me let me know in the chat okay so we can evaluate this and let's see how it uh, how it works if we write simply the basis like this is this function we write it in the basis and we apply it to this vector that we write as before Then this goes like we can take it off, out, and this too, because they are only numbers, like real numbers or complex numbers, not real numbers normally, and they uh, they don't interfere with the rest. So we'll have this kind of stuff, and this function will act on the elements of the basis. As we know, this part is the Kronecker delta that we defined before. So mu mu. Oh, sorry. This is a mu. A mu. And then this object will be the product of these two components. Oh, there is a mistake on the PDF. I will repost it later. That is a real number. Okay, then this number is what we call, we call a scalar. It's a function uh, that simply has a real value and has is not like doesn't have components like uh, vectors or dual vectors. It's simply a real number that can vary from other parameters, but not from transformation. So scalars will be very important because they are invariant under learned transformations. It it's easily seen that this kind of object uh, doesn't change when we put 
when we do a lot of this transformation. Okay. So let's give a little example for two other vectors. We consider the gradient of a scalar function. So let's take a scalar function and let's define this gradient as the derivative of the gradient over some coordinates. And this object is in the cotangent space. So it is written in the basis in the basis of the cotangent space. And if we calculate everything, uh, we will see that it transforms like a like a well, lecture. So we can write it. Yes. Uh, There's something wrong with the notation here. Um, well, it transforms like a dual tensors and Later on, we will write this as normally we will use this notation, but you will always see sometimes uh, the scalar function, comma, mu. This is the same notation for the, the same thing for uh, for the, like different notation for for the same thing. But it's important to remind to remember this. Okay, so now that we have both our vectors, you have an idea for tangent space and we have the dual vectors. Then we are gonna finally talk about tensors. Okay, so tensors, what are they? We'll consider, we will see that a tensor of rank KL is a big word here. It's a multilinear map that goes, let me write it, from a collection of dual spaces. And collection of vector space, this is the correct, vector spaces to a real number. So what am I saying with this, this multilinear With this, I'm saying that a tensor is basically a function that has a good property, so it behaves in a pretty way, that you put uh, here some k uh, dual vectors, so you put w1, wk, and here you put some vectors, so v1 to vk, and it takes you to a real number. So for example, uh, dual vectors are tensors, are tensors. So I want to write this because it can be confused with the other things. Because if we take W, well, omega, uh, this is, a, and as we said, this is a function from T P to R, then we can say k is equal to zero and l is equal to one. Then we get rid of all of these, we get one of these and we get rid of the other ones and it goes to R. So this is a tensor, this is a zero one tensor. In a similar way, we can think of vectors as one zero tensors. Because one thing I haven't mentioned about uh, vec of, uh, dual spaces is that if you have a space, you take the dual, you can take, again, the dual of the dual space, and this is V. So this would be the set of all the functions that go from here to the real numbers. And you can prove that this, this set is equal to to V. 
Therefore, the vectors are objects that act on the dual vectors and uh, bring them to R. Therefore, in the in this case, we would have this k equal to one and l equal to zero, and you will get uh, a real number. In the same way, um, scalars, so simply real numbers, are zero, zero tensors, because you don't act on anything, and you get a real, because you have a real number, but you don't act on any vector or, or uh, one form. OK, so this is the formal definition of a tensor. Normally, well, normally, a lot of books say that a tensor is something that transforms, like a tensor, which is funny, but it's nice to have the good idea of what a tensor is. So let's define some things over these tensors before. Uh, Thinking of components. Let's define first the tensorial product, the tensor product, tensor product. So this product basically, um, say you have two tensors T and S. If you multiply them, you know the arguments are K four. Like this is a key K. L tensor and this is a an M tensor. So you have the entries from from the dual the cotangent space for T. You have the entries. Okay. This is K plus one to K plus M. This is not correct. M. M. Okay. No. So you have the entries for T, the entries of the cotangent space for S, and here you will have the entries of the tangent space. This is L. This is L for uh, T. And oh, well, I'm writing here, but we will go here. Well, I can write maybe. L plus one, two, L plus N will be the entries of the tangent space for S. So you have this object that takes all these arguments. And this is basically T evaluated on, it, on its arguments times, like this is a real number, times another real number that will be these arguments here. So this is the basic uh, multiplication we will have on this object. So with this tensor product, what we can do is define a basis from the for the vector space that is formed out of tensors. And we will have this base that, is, uh, con that consists on all the elements from here. So, which I don't know if this is all, I think it should be. then we have all the elements of the basis that are of this form. So same as we did before, it's a vector space. Uh, the discussion about the objects is always going to be similar. We can write every tensor as its components times the elements of the basis. I'm not going to rewrite the elements of the basis, but the components will be written as follows. So mu one to, to mu q, I don't have space. And as lower indexes, V1 
the atom with these elements of the bases. So we will sum over it's a linear combination, and this is what, what we usually see as a tensor. It's all the components. So as Pablo said before that um, tensors are, he was asking if tensors are matrices or not. Um, they aren't, they are not matrices, but some of them can be represented. For example, uh, if you have a two, two tensor T, uh, the components, you have new, mm, maybe this is too big, the new, new uh, lambda rho. Each one of these, like if you take all the things to be zero, 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 this is the first entry of your matrix that, define, that uh, describes this map. So you have T zero, 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 zero. Well, no, this is a four by four by four, Never mind. One, one, let's simplify everything. Oh, uh, here too. Okay, now we have mu nu only. You can take all the things like zero, zero, one, zero, and you can have like uh, one, one, T, one, one, T, zero, one. And this would be the matrix associated to your tensor, but it's not in itself a matrix. Simply all the linear um, functions can be represented and represented as a matrix when the phase they are acting on is finite. So with this, okay. Um, yeah, we will ask the other objects. Again, we have seen its components. We have to see how it transforms. So if we have a, a, the tensor the same way as before, but it's a new uh, tensor that we have transformed these ones by a Lorentz, uh, Lorentz transformation. So from L, then we have all the Lorentz matrices. Right, all the, well, this is a meal, but with the primes underneath. This is quite long to write, but it will be fine. Uh, yeah, if, if someone can say uh, how you're doing, because we are almost at an hour and we have to like half. So I don't know if you want to stop uh, when we end this discussion or just continue forever uh, till we finish. So I would need to know. Continue until what? Until we finish all the tensor thing, but it might be two hours. Two hours? Oh, uh, I mean, you got to ask the others, but I won't be here for two hours. I got things to do. No, so, not two more continue. hours, but one more. Maybe. Potential. Uh, it's up to you guys. If you are very tired or, or I mean, it's not that I'm tired. Yeah. It's just like literally in forty minutes I have to go. So then, if the other ones say something, we'll... yeah, that's, that, that's uh, up to the others. Well, while while they write in chat, um, so we have a new tensor after the transformation. And this defines how the components of the old tensor are transforming. So it's uh, the product of these gamma matrices. Okay, we'll, we will do then half a lecture and the next day will be the second part then. Uh, I have to decide where, where to, to end then. Uh, give me a sign. Okay. Okay, we will give examples of tensors and then we will stop. Okay, so now we know what a tensor is, how it transforms, what the coordinates are, and we can start with some examples that we will see. Okay, here that we will see are not um, 
very general. There are, there are special cases, but they are worth mentioning because they are um, not tensors, uh, tensors that you will see very often. So first tensor we are going to see, if you rem remember the, met the metric of the Minkowski space, is we we wrote it as a matrix minus one 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 with all zeros in here this is a tensor it is a zero two tensors because well it has lower indexes and not upper indexes it's a two form it's a yeah two form and it acts it acts on vectors it leaves no it doesn't it uh, well yeah it's it's a two, zero to uh, tensor, and we can define over over this metric what we call the inner product, or the pseudo inner product, because it's not the mathematical definition of inner product is not um, the same as is more strict uh, and uh, the metric doesn't follow all the properties that it should. Mainly um, any inner product, let's write it like this, should always be positive. And um, the one we are going to define is not. But it is easy. As, as last time that we thought of the invariant as a distance, even if it's not because it's sometimes negative, um, it's useful to think about it in this way. And you will see in a lot of places that they simply call inner product and that's it. So we define our pseudo inner product like the function, like this is a function that takes two vectors and you get one real number that we will calculate during the summation over mu and over new. So let's take only mu zero one and mu zero one to make it easier. You would have some vector on say one, two, zero and one, one. And let's say the metric is minus one, one. So as if we were only considering time and the x coordinate, so you would have this means that you would have so n zero zero v zero w w zero plus n zero one and n one zero are zero because this is diagonal. Right. Then we'll have only uh, these two components. One, one. This would be minus. This is one. This is one. So minus one plus one times uh, times zero times one. This is it. This is zero. So we have minus one. So the inner pro the product between v and w is minus one. See, you can have a negative one, so it's not an inner product per se. But but it for it it uh, does the same job. So once we have uh, this uh, this object defined, we say that two vectors v and w w are orthogonal if the inner product is zero. So we have this definition, this little definition. And it's uh, important to notice that two vectors that are orthogonal uh, will always be, even if you change the basis, uh, this will always be the same because this object is a scalar. So it doesn't change on the transformations, on the Lorentz transformations. So two vectors that are, are orthogonal will always be orthogonal. So we know that if we take a basis that is orthogonal, it will always, and, and two vectors will always be, and 
all this stuff is consistent. So based, as we saw last time that we based, um, we classified events by saying if the interval was lower than zero, or greater than zero, or equal to zero, we can do the same thing for the inner product. So if this object is less than zero, then we get, well, did I skip something? Yeah, I skipped something. Wait, sorry. Yeah, once you have uh, all of these defined, you can, you can define the norm of a vector as the product, the inner product of the vector by itself. So it will be this. And you can take this cl classification from two events to the classification of simply one vector. So you can say, if it's negative, uh, you can say that the vector is time-like. Again, it's the same analogy as last time. Is zero is if it's uh, light. Like, it will be light-like or no, and if it's superior to zero, then it's phase like. Again, only notation. Then that's one example of a tensor. We have another one, the Kronecker delta, which we defined before. So one if mu equals rho, and zero if mu is different from rho. This is a tensor one one. And I forgot to mention that um, the order, where is it? the order of the components is important because if you go to the map, to this definition, uh, if you put an argument here or here, the function may behave differently. So you have to be consistent where, when, with where do you put the coefficients the coefficients, the indexes. <clears throat> okay, so with that, let's go back here. This tensor is a special case because it doesn't matter which one you put first because it's the identity, it's pretty simple. It's a one-one tensor. So it takes one vector and one dual vector. <clears throat> And again, once we define this, we can consider the inverse of the metric. So we wrote the indexes here before, but now we can consider them here. And then we have that n mu nu n mu rho is equal to the delta mu rho. And we have found the inverse of our metric. Okay, another example of a tensor. There's only this one left, if I'm correct. Yeah, this is the last example. So another example of the tensor is the Levitz-Civita symbol. It is a zero for tensor. So we will have four indexes here. We say mu, nu, rho, and sigma. We will define this as being one when. Okay, see ya, Pablo. Uh, when this is an even permutation of one, two, three. So well, I'm doing the example I give the yeah. Uh, we see it's minus one if it's mu nu rho sigma, if it is a not permutation of or the of this, and zero if it's none of the the others. So if you have sigma of I don't know, uh, one, one, zero, one, this is zero because it's not a permutation of these four numbers. But if you have, say, 0, 1, 2, 3 would be 1, because doing zero permutations, permutations is an even permutation. Doing 
one, zero, two, three is one, two, because you are only, wait, uh, this is, uh, this is one or minus one. Uh, it's minus one, right? If uh, Panda knows and can confirm, but you're doing only one permutation, so it's odd. You have a minus. If you did another one, and you had one, zero, three, two, it will be a one, etc. So all of these uh, tensors, th this one is a little, I'm not uh, going to go into detail, but the last tensor we saw is a bit weird. So it has some properties um, that are not tensor-like in other spaces, but here it works, so we will talk about it later. And these tensors, we have seen are the only ones that have the components remain the same uh, by transformation. So if you take a Lorentz transformation, the identity is going to remain the same. Where is it here? The identity is going to be the same. Even if you change uh, any change of, of coordination, this is the same of co coordination of coordination. If you do Lorentz transformations, then the matrix is going to be the same because it characterizes, characterizes the structures of space-time. It doesn't make sense that it changes over inertial transformation. It remains invariant, and uh, this symbol does too. But this is important that these are, the, these are the only ones that do this. So I think we're going to let it here. Next time, we are going to talk about about some operation over the tensors and maybe do some exercises because I think we did a little more than half. Yeah. So yeah, maybe some exercises and uh, manipulation and operations over the tensors.